Thank you so much and welcome to this, uh, you know, is this, the, is this the second edition of African Tea Time this year? Uh, glad that uh, you people could make it, uh, you know, this time around again. Uh, we are looking at a very, very, very interesting, uh, uh, you know, very interesting area of uh, assistive technology and, uh, you know, all this digital media now that we do have and how it's playing around the issues of politics on the continent. We are honored to have uh, Theopolina Kandime, who has been here, um, you know, as a student and is a lecturer now, uh, Faculty of Human Sciences in Namibia University of uh, Science and Technology. As well, we also have Dr. Shingi Mavima, who most of us, I think, on this platform have met. Uh, he has been here uh, for quite a while, and now is an assistant professor in the history department, the University of Toledo. And they are all going to be uh, handling really, really uh, good topics. Today, your moderator is Jorema Wadu. And uh, yep, I will not uh, waste a lot of time. Uh, surely ask, uh, you know, Teopolina to take us through her, her, her presentation today, which is on social media as a catalyst for changing uh, the political environment uh, of Namibia. So Teopolina, please take it. Okay, thank you, Doc. Um, so my name is Teopolina Kanime and I'm from Namibia and I'm happy to talk about uh, this topic today to you all, which is social media as a catalyst for the changing political environment of Namibia. So I would have a lot of graphs. So if they become too much, uh, you can just tell me to go ahead because I, I, I was struggling to figure out which one I should keep and which one I should take out because I thought they will all just help us understand the whole social media and how it has helped us move from where we were as a country 30 years ago to where we are now. So now um, just locating the country. So Namibia is in Southern Africa and Angola, Zambia, Botswana and South Africa are our biggest neighbor. Although we also share a river with Zimbabwe. Now, next slide. Now, a brief history of Namibia. Um, so Namibia has been inhabited, what we know today as Namibia has been inhabited since 25,000 BC, but mostly by the Sun people. And this is evident through their work of rock painting that is also among some of the, um, among some of our um, lovely heritage as a country. And um, also apart from the Sun people, uh, the country also later became home to Bantu people because of the Bantu migration. Now the Bantu people live mainly on the northern part of the country and then the sun as well as the Nama people live in the southern part of the country. So the Bantu people in the northern part and then the sun people, the Nama people in the southern part of the country. Now from 1884 to 1915, um, our country was a German colony, but then as all the other uh, colonies of Germany, when Germany lost the war, the, 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 the world war, the first world war, um, they also lost us as a colony and we were handed over to South Africa as a, so that South Africa can become our protectorate and help us administer our country. And that was supposed to not go on for a long period of time. Nope, that was the computer. Okay. That was not supposed to go on for a long time, but it actually lasted from 1915 up to 1989. And um, how we got out of that is because uh, Namibia uh, went to war under uh, the, the leadership of SWAPO, which is the liberation movement that helped us lead that war. Now, um, 
we then, uh, so the, the peace agreement was reached in 1989 for Namibia to leave, I mean, for South Africa to leave Namibia. And one of the agreements between um, the two countries was that uh, the country was to, to have its first election. Now, before I go to the first election, I just want to show you the three branches of power that we have in Namibia. Next slide. All right, so like many other countries around the world, so we have the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. Uh, and the executive and the legislature are all voted for by the people after five years. Every five years, we have an election to vote the president as well as our leaders who represent us in the National Assembly as well as the National Council. However, during the first election that we had in 1989, uh, we only had the legislature election just to vote the people who would represent us in the National Assembly, but not the president. So our first president was elected by the National Assembly itself. So they voted um, for that president, Dr. Sen Yoma. And then only in our second election presidential, I mean, only in our second election as a country, which happened in 1994, were we able to vote for the first time a president. Now, let's go to that first election on the next slide. So as I said already, uh, in, in, in 1989, so that is when our election was held from the 7th up to the 11th of November. And then, so we only voted for the National Assembly leaders and then the Southwest Africa People Organization, which is SWAPO, which led the war against South Africa, obviously won because that's almost a trend in the whole Southern Africa. It's like the, the party that leads the war, I mean, the, the country to independence was almost always guaranteed to win the election. So they won the election with 57%. And then so that meant also their leader, Dr. Sem Nyoma was also elected as the president. Now, that was a good thing because um, all these political parties with different ideologies were able to come together and trust Suapo with bringing the country from this bad past, you know, into ushering it into the new, the new era. Now, as, uh, now, obviously at independence, there were different opinions. Some, we got independence finally in 1990. So, this, we were one of the latest country in Africa to get independence. So people have seen what have happened in all these other African countries that were getting independence. So some people uh, believed that we were just going to go back in either a civil war or the economy will collapse and all that. And then obviously there were Op um, people who were optimists, you know, that, okay, we are going to be this exemplary country, everything is going to be fine, and we are going to be excellent. But uh, we didn't go back to the war, but we are also not as great as we can be. So under SWAPO, Namibia has been able to remain relatively peaceful. The economy is relatively okay. And they have done some great things like free education and free healthcare and all those things. But one thing that, uh, just the next slide, one thing that the government of SWAP has failed is social economic development as well as poor governance of public entities. Now, the social economic development here is more in terms of land delivery. So the government has failed to provide land to the people. And in our country, 
land and maybe in most African countries, if not the world, land is the mean of production. So without land, the people do not have, they, they cannot, even if you educate them, they, they cannot really get out of poverty, you know, because they cannot grow food. They also do not have houses. And so this has been going on for the past 30 years. And now the generation that was born around independence, they are 30 years old now. And they have been really unhappy about that because they come to places like Vinduk, which is very beautiful to, to visitors, like really beautiful. But then they stay in places like this because uh, renting in Vinduk is expensive and then they do not have access to land where they can build their own houses. So that is where the whole downfall of Swapo started, its inability to reduce the gap between the poor and the rich. Now the rich here being the former um, uh, colonial um, apartheid South African who remain in Namibia, as well as the few ruling elites from Swapo who took over from the South African government. So in actual sense, it was just a trunk. It's, it's, it's just the government that changed, but when it comes to land, we, 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 it, it, was still, it is still the same as it was in 1989. And that angers a lot of youth. And on the next slide. So um, now th that anger didn't start, um, that anger didn't start just now, it has been ongoing. However, uh, from, 19, from 1989, to here I've put 1999, but let's just say to 2014. What had happened then was that Swapo, uh, which is the ruling party, despite this disenfranchisement this, this of the people, even if they are angry, Swapo had their resources. They owned, um, they, they, there was even, even growing up, I didn't see the distinction between Swapo and our government because they, they control their resources. So that meant um, during the election, for example, they control the narrative, they control the media. And so they have access to all the machinery that they need to campaign. So what happened is that even if people were not happy, especially young people, Swapo used, uh, people say Namibia is democratic, but they use other hidden ways to hold on to power. So for example, uh, in 1999, if you see here, you would see that uh, a party emerged, um, COD. It wasn't there from 1989 up to, 19, up to 1998, but it came in existence into 1999. But that was because it was formed by young people within Swapo who were not happy with how Swapo was doing things, especially when it comes to land delivery. And also because as you see from 1994, Swapo started to gain the two third majority in the National Assembly. So remember that they were put in power by other, by other parties at the beginning of independence. But because now they became, um, they were able to control the government, they, they are able to campaign. So they grew from 57 to now obtaining sometimes even 70% of the vote. So now they were able to make some changes to the constitution, like taking us to war in DRC, in the civil war in DRC, or taking us in the civil war in Angola, changing the constitution to increase the presidential term and all those things. So not everybody was happy, you know? And so COD was formed, but COD, it didn't last, you know, it did not last, not because people didn't want it, but because Swapo did everything that it could to make sure that it did not last. I remember, um, so this, the people in DLC would be called names like spies, uh, the people, even my mom or my dad, they believed that if they, so Swapo would say things like, if you vote for COD, South Africa would come back 
in our country, but we know that's not true. But because our parents when are not educated and they really don't understand, so they believe that Swapo is everything and that is how they, 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 they if they vote anything else, then it will, it, it, it will be over for them. And these are people who have been in war from 1966 to 1989. So surely they don't want to go back there. Next slide. So it, um, I skipped some election here, just to show you that, um, next slide again. Yeah, so I skipped some election, I mean election year, just to show you that the, the trend didn't end in the 90s, up to 2014. If you see, this is uh, the, 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 the National Assembly election. So we, you see at the beginning, we had 72 chairs in, in, in parliament or in the National Assembly. So Swapo somewhere there in the middle, because of their two third majority, they were even able to change the constitution so that they can increase the number of chairs in parliament or seats in parliament from 72 to 96. And so until 2014, that election, they were able to still get 77 of the 96 uh, seats that are available. And on the next slide. So, and then uh, their candidate, um, uh, our current president now in, in, in 2014 was able to get 86 of the votes. Now, and I must say it clearly, it's like the issues of vote, vote uh, irregularity do not exist in Namibia in that much, but it, it is the ideology, you know, how they, and up to 2014, how the Swapo party have indoctrinated people to believe that Swapo is the only way and anything else is wrong, you know, and, um, I, I remember in 2004 when we got our second president and any person, especially business people, any person who is head supporting any other party other than Swapo was made to uh, the community were told that that person is a traitor, that person is bringing back war in our country. So, and then like these people go out of business. So people were scared. And, 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 and no one was really willing to, to talk about it. And, and people were just voting, especially in rural areas. And then the next slide. So that was in 2014, that, that, that is, it's, it's just yesterday. So that was our last election really where Swapo dominated us, where they were getting 86% of the vote and uh, when you go back to the presentation later but we won't go back we, you would also see that in our first election 95 percent of the people who registered to vote turned up they turned up and they came to vote because they believed this was the right thing for them to, to do but as time went by you you would have like 30 percent of the voters they are coming to vote and those 30 percent normally they are swapo party member uh and they just voting and also voting out of fear and then young people just stayed away because there was no alternative and any other person who left swapo to start a political party uh, was orchestrated and then like they just made up story and then either they they are they are work they, they lose their job their businesses and all that. But then 2014 in our country was a, a, a real turning point. Uh, so we have um, a guy, he's, he's very young. He was born in 1988. And so he studied uh, politics. So his name is Job Shipuram Panda. And then, so he was part of uh, Swapo Youth League. And one of, uh, obviously he has uh, his negative things because he's a very radical leader. Uh, and I'm not going to talk about the negative things about him today because I'm more focusing on what he really did for us as young Namibian to understand the importance of 
participating in, in the political arena. So in 2014, when uh, the president was elected with 86%, um, so one of the things that uh, Job did as a Swapo youth leader then was to ask the president if he would be willing, not just the president, but also Swapo, if they'll be willing to now start negotiating um, with people who have land. In, in Namibia, we didn't even want land for farming. It's just young people saying, we want land to build houses. We don't wanna, we don't want to rent because renting here is, the prices are even exorbitant because people who own houses know that you would want to rent whether you want or not, or you would live in the shacks as the one that I showed you. So Job, uh, when he asked um, the, 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 the Swapo government, they were not willing because uh, they know that if they give us land, then they lose out because it's them who own these houses where young people are renting. So what they did, um, maybe just a brief uh, understanding of how Namibia is structured, especially Vindu. During the apartheid era, we were separated according to race. So uh, white Namibians lived in nicer suburbs and then black Namibians live in what we call squatter camp, um, informal settlement. And then so what Job did in 2014 was uh, as a scare tactic. This is the first picture, the one that is written in 2014. As a scare tactic for government, his, he, him and his friend went on Facebook in a white, uh, in a formerly white neighborhood and say, we are going to put our shakes. Since we are going, since you are not giving us land, we are going to put our shakes, which are bad houses, which obviously the government doesn't want to come to the white neighborhood. So they said, we are going to put our shakes in this neighborhood we, so, so, so that we can be near hospital, shops, and all those things. So we are going to put our shakes here. And obviously they were just joking and wanting to get the attention of, of the government, which they got. But apart from getting the attention of the government for a short while, they got the attention of the young people. So here was a government that has never been um, challenged. And here was someone who was born in 1988 challenging the government and saying, if you are not giving us land, we are going to stay here. And so it just spread. It spread and, and it spread people, young people asking for land. But then also when we realize, or young people realize that they were not going to get land, job changed from the issue of land and said, the only way we can get land for us to live is if we start participating in politics. So now it was no longer wrong to say there's an alternative to Swapo. And all this is not happening through the radio. This is happening through Facebook. It's happening through Facebook. The next slide, I'll show you um, what happened. So then, so all throughout from 2014 to, to 2019, so Job is mobilizing youth, posting very um, uh, straightforward, um, criticism against Swapo. And then now young people are supporting him, you know? Now we are all writing, because I mean, there's something about me being in my house, writing, you know, and saying my idea in the comfort of my house, as opposed to going to a rally, you know, and, and listening, because sometimes also people were, 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 were crucified for just showing up at the political uh, really. Now, I just need to see what Job is saying and supporting him where Job, they'll go to demonstrate. So they started demonstrating if either uh, someone, because the government has a tendency of, of, of not helping people when they are evicted uh, because of rent. So when, when, when there's a demonstration against this thing, so we go. One of the things that he organized was the demonstration against our government wanting to build a parliament that is costing us 7 billion Namibian dollars. Now, one Namibian dollar is equal to, um, I mean, one US dollar is equal to 17. Uh, one US dollar is equal to 17 Namibian dollars. So you can do the math. This was going to be a very expensive parliament. So we, we did all that thing between then. 
And then so by 2019, when our next um, election was set to happen, we were busy, we had been mobilized, we have been mobilized already. So then in 2019, when our election was supposed to happen in, in December, something again happened in June. One of the, the mayor, one of the mayor of, of, of a town called Ondangwa died. That was bad, but in a sense, it was a blessing in disguise a little bit to the young people. Because when this mayor died, now there was a by-election. And the norm was that, uh, it, now Ondangwa is my hometown, the norm in, when that mayor was elected, he won with 92%, 92% of the vote. Now, when he died, Swapo obviously just thought they would just, uh, the election would happen. Look, I'm and, sorry, but my life has been nothing but misery since my identity was stolen. How many years ago was that? Jessica Fernandez, I don't know. Chingiko, uh, could we uh, maybe put her off? I don't know. Jessica Fernandez is uh, uh, disrupting. Okay, you can continue on with your point. Okay, so, but then in that election, uh, something happened because now youth were mobilized. We also realized that our constitution has a provision for independent candidate. Independent candidate, this is someone just running, not on any party ticket. And that was our, our saving grace because in the past, if you go into a new political party, then Swapo will start um, laboring you as an opportunist and all that. But now it was just an independent candidate uh, representing young people. So a, a young person was put in that um, to run uh, for, for, for the Ondangwa by election. And as you can see, so she's here, Emmanuel Angeline. And then, so she didn't win, but look at what happened for the first time. So she had 1,402, and then the Swapo candidate had 1,903, I mean, 936. So he won by just a few hundreds. When in the past, he would have been guaranteed just to win automatically. So what, what that did, it showed us that there's a path like we can, if we vote, we can really bring up changes in our country. Now the next slide. So when the election came in, 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 so that was in June. So in 2019, uh, December, when it was now time for our presidential as well as national assembly election. So a, a man came on the scene, uh, Dr. Pandreni Tula, or young, it, it, he's not young, but in the context of our country, he's young, you know, and he was being supported by the young people. And I, I put here also his um, uh, Facebook profile because that is exactly where he started. He started, so he would post all, all the campaign information, the manifesto, young people had discussion forum, where are we meeting and people would meet, like he would draw crowds, not because of the radio, but again, through social media. Now the results. The next slide. All right, so then when the election came, there was a very big um, change. So Swapo, normally, this is a party that gets around, remember they had 77 seats and then they were never challenged and then so in this election, at least they, they lost some seat and they only got 63 seats. And then so what that meant, it meant that they also lost their two third majority. So right now they are still the ruling party. And that was the first time that young people did that and voted for some other opposition parties. And then 
what it means is now that they do not have the two third majority is that whatever they need to pass in our parliament, it would have to go through discussion. Because in the past, when they had 77 seats, they would just say, we want, um, like they, 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 they changed the constitution um, so that um, they can make this measure for fishing quotas, obviously to benefit the few. And it, it is just brought in the parliament and, and they say, okay, this is what is supposed to do, let's vote. Knowingly that no SWAPO member will vote against those motions. So they lost um, the two third majority, but the interesting result came from the presidential election, which is on the next slide. So remember in 2014, our president was voted with 86 percent but in 2019 he only got 56 so which obviously he won by six percent you know because you need 50 uh, percent and also the the problem here only came up from the fact that there are a lot of parties who if the parties were willing to, to give their support to the independent candidate, um, it, it might have been even better. But still, for us, especially the young people, just seeing the president and him knowing that he didn't win with the 86% that they are normally used and you only got 56%, that was enough for the young people. Now that is for the presidential as well as the National Assembly result. And then next slide. So now um, remember that our national and pres I mean presidential and national assembly election always happen first, and then the following year the regional and local election would happen. So when we real when young people realize that okay, they were able to reduce SWAPO majority in the National Assembly, and the president also didn't get um, the, the, the normal percentage that they normally get. Uh, so now young people were even more fired up to take part in the regional and local government, which to us, yes, the presidential election is important, the National Assembly is important, but regional and local election are important to us because these are the people that live in our villages, in our towns and speak to our issues. So now again, um, young people, obviously from, as you can see here, like um, Winnie, uh, this girl is from an opposition party, but also we have young people who are just independent candidates as all these other, as all these other, other members. We, 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 for the first time, they were not scared again to just put out their posters. These are their campaign posters on Facebook and say, in my region or in my town, I am campaigning, please vote for me. And some of them either is part of a political party, but some of them just as an individual who is saying, I was born in this town, I am campaigning, please vote for me. And Job, um, uh, who obviously started this whole thing, his board, he even just put up um, a, 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 a banner now, a, a, I mean that, a, a, a banner in town and say, I am running not for a village, but as a mayor for the city of Vinduk, which is the capital city of Vinduk. Never heard of, nobody has ever, not any opposition party has ever been uh, ruling um, the city of Vinduk. It has always been in the hand of the ruling party. And then so, when the election came, Swapo still thought they were going to do what they did in 2019, lose a little bit, but still be in control. But that did not happen. Let's see the next slide. So that is uh, the result of what happened during our election. I decided not to use uh, the, the graph here, but to use the map. So SWAPO would represent the red, and then all the other parts will represent uh, whatever is in the hand of the opposition party. 
But what's important here is to know that the red part, those are our rural areas. So where my mom, my dad, and most of the old people live. So Swapo in the local and um, in the regional and local government election, they still maintain their stronghold in the village. But what happened is they lost all our towns and cities. So as you can see here, they also in the middle here, where that little dot is, they also lost the city of Vinduk, which is um, the, the capital city. They lost all our here. So they lost all our coastal towns where our fishing, um, I mean, our, our fishery uh, activities happen. And they literally lost all the important towns of, 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 of our country, which to us, uh, to the young people was a great uh, achievement because it means now we, we can come up with ways how to solve pressing issues that are facing young people who most of them live in urban areas, you know, and, and, and also an indication that young people, are, are, even if it doesn't happen today, through social media, it's, an, it's, it, it, it's a good thing because we now understand that through social media, we, when, we might not have been able to beat or, or to, to, to win over everything from Swapo in the 2019 as well as the 2020 election, but we have reduced them from what they were in 2014. And if things continue to go at the same pace that they are going, we believe that come um, the next election, which is in 20, uh, I think 2024 or 2025, then things will look a, a, a bit better. And also um, the last thing that I, 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 would, I would want to say is that uh, not, also, not just look better then, but it's like the president now, because he knows that how he act would affect, because this is his last time, but obviously his party would want their candidate to another candidate to come on. But he knows that what, no matter, I mean, what, how he acts toward the young people, plight and their and their and their suffering would affect has a possibility to affect the result of the next president so we are no longer just um, a group of people that uh, the government under swapo can tell propaganda and then we listen and lastly the means of communication has changed because nbc which is the national broadcasting corporation used to give them time, but it's like, these young people do not need time because they have Facebook. The next slide. So yeah, in, in conclusion, um, I'll just say that um, as, you, as, as you have seen, our election, uh, the first election in our country was started on it, it was started on a, on, a, on, a, on a good foundation, that hope of building a better country, you know, uh, different political parties coming together to support um, Swapo so that they can move us from uh, apartheid or uh, South African apartheid rule. And I would say, okay, they have done well in some aspects as I've highlighted them, but they have failed on land delivery. And this is not even land for production. We are just talking about land for building houses. And then uh, the, the next thing is um, they have capitalized on, on fear and making people believe that voting otherwise would take us back where our parents were, but we understand better. And through social media, if it's not, closed, which I, I hope it won't happen, um, things will definitely become even better for Namibians, especially the young Namibians. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, you know, Tio Paulina. You know, I, I was listening to you and um, uh, just uh, kind of uh, comparing 
uh, today is not for Uganda, but kind of a, everything else you're describing seems to me like, uh, you know, could be transferred to Uganda and what's happening there at the moment with, uh, uh, it seems to me that, uh, the, uh, you know, the urbanized centers of cities are kind of uh, uh, reaching that point where, you know, they're really, really getting much more critical of, um, uh, you know, the, the politicians and their, their leadership. And so that is really, really, uh, you know, good to see. And uh, uh, unlike you guys uh, in Namibia who didn't get your internet, uh, you know, cut off, uh, you know, there was a situation where they actually just cut off the internet a day to elections and didn't have up to now. Because of the power of Facebook, uh, WhatsApp, and, uh, you know, um, most of the social media kind of handles, uh, you know, it was working against the ruling class, especially because the younger folks understand how to market themselves way. Because think about it, if you're not going to a radio station because the person who owns it is, is connected to the politicians or the business person, like you said, in Namibia doesn't want to lose their business, then they had the option of Facebook and all this. And, those spread like wildfire, a recording that then, you know, goes on, you know, to move. So uh, I understand why this would be, uh, uh, you know, forced to record with, uh, you know, even in the coming years, because it's, um, it's, it's not going to get, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, I, I think won't retrogress. I think we are going to see the influence of uh, social media, uh, you know, going on um, a lot. So I don't know, I think, it is four, it's 13 minutes to five. Maybe I can take uh, two questions, two, three, two questions, then we can, uh, you know, get to Shingi. Uh, the rest, uh, so two ways to think about it. You can actually uh, just, uh, uh, I should have said this earlier, you can send in form of a message or, you know, just shout it out to, to, to your Paulina, like two people, and then uh, we can, uh, uh, you know, cross over to Shingi. Um, who wants to go? I can't see all the people. Did I see Mike? No. Okay. Looks like uh, no one is actually going. But uh, um, I, you know, I, I just wanted to also have another comment around. Uh, is it is it true for me to actually, uh, you know, based on the map you showed, the landless people's movement, uh, you know, the regional and local elections by map. Uh, are you trying to say, you know, because of the uh, the importance of the land, you know, and you know, for the youth and generally as a, you know, a form of, um, uh, but what, what the factor of production has become, is that their major, uh, you know, kind of campaign uh, uh, pivot? Yeah, that is, uh, so the landless people movement is, um, so it, that that is their, their their whole focus is it's so it's by young people mainly from the south is, is when you when you can see it, if you from the first um slide uh, i said uh namibia the first inhabitant of namibia this way the sun people as well as the nama people and um most of them they live in the south which also has um fertile not fertile land for farm for for farming crops, but fertile land for um, for cattle farming. And uh, obviously, when uh, South African um, came in our country, this is now the apartheid uh, colonial time. When they came in our country, they took their land. And so, while people like me from the northern part of the country are affected, when I come to Vinduk, at least I have. My, my parents in the northern part, most of them didn't lose their land. But now the people from the south, not only the, are they unable to afford land in Vinduk, but they also don't have land to go to because their land there is taken. So their whole campaign was around um, just uh, at least retaining their, their, their own pride, you know, so, so telling people that at least if we, we, we win, we want to have dialogues, you know, we want to have dialogues. And I must just again repeat that 
yes, it's right for Namibians to want to have farming land, but these people don't, they are not yet at the farming aspect of it. They are just at a piece of land for them to call home. Yes, to answer your question, Doc, yes, that is their whole um, issue that they ran on, which is providing land to the people, especially people from the southern part of the country. That's why you see on the results, you see that they won uh, a lot of votes from mm -hmm. the northern, I mean, the southern part of the country. Okay, all right. Yeah. And so I see another question here from Anne who says, how do young people in Namibia make sure that pre-existing elitist forms of political representation that privilege the middle and upper class, some ethnic groups, region, you know, I think, and, and regions, and those from urban centers, you know, do not persist. So I think she's trying to get at the fact that even when she looks at the people who are, you know, representing the the, the voiceless, they still seem to be, uh, you know, elitists. Uh, and um, uh, I think from a certain, it's the upper class majorly, uh, uh, and from certain regions of so is there, how are, how are you know, uh, Namibians trying to deal with that? Yeah, so I think, um, so that's the thing, especially with uh, the landless people movement. Uh, for me, that is, to me, that is, that was like our first really attempt at, um, at fighting, um, not elitism, but for me, it will be, tribalism because um, the, the issues, young people, in a, so there's the whole issue of land, like we all want land, but then um, it, it, it came to a, a point where you have to realize that I want land, but I am from the Northern part of the country where my parents' land was never taken. So it's, us, it's about us having dialogues and, and knowing that supporting uh, someone from, for example, the Landless Movement Party might not benefit me that much because they are fighting for land, ancestral land from where they are, but me supporting them give them a voice that otherwise they wouldn't have. For example, if I live, because if I live in the South, I, I, I can have an option to vote for Swapo, for example, which does not speak to their issue. So by me voting for, for, for the landless people movement, that is how like we, we fight, especially ethnicity, you know, which was also one of the things that Swapo benefited a lot from because the, the people in the northern part of the country, which is my tribe, they vote a lot for Swapo because if the members in, in that party are also from the northern part of the country. And also, uh, just to end to that question, the, for example, in Vinduk, um, for Joe, for when, when, when the election came out, so Swapo still, because there were 13 seats up for the local, um, for, the, for, the, for the city of Vinduk, for people to, to rule the city of Vinduk. And so Swapo still got six seats. You know, Swapo still got six seats. And then the other nine seats were not within Swapo, but the young people, both from the landless people movement, from AR, PDM, and all these uh, other opposition party were willing to work together. Obviously they made Job, who is also from the main um, tribe, the mayor, but the deputy mayor of Vinduk, for example, is from the landless people movement. So I think we do that by just realizing that yes, we have problems, but some other people have bigger problem than ours. It's still in its infancy, but it is there. And just the willingness to work together as one, as, as, as young people, because, uh, in the past, really, and, and, and this I can even say, my mom, it's, it's like, it's a thing that Swapo has used against, and it's come obviously from the apartheid era, where the, the whole thing of you are Vambo, you are Damara, you are white, you are whatnot, and, and like the whole divide and conquer, and it's like, 
these young people, especially now in the city of Binduk, just coming together and saying, I don't care where you, what you are, but we are going to work together in trying to speak to each other's issues. Okay. There's another question from, uh, if this will be our last one of, you know, for you this evening, it's from Mike. Uh, it says, I, I don't know if you're pushing it, but how much of a danger is there in SWAPO taking over the internet to control content and limit other parties being able to organize? Yeah, so, um, so I really hope right now. Um, and and uh, he goes down to say, just a second, that uh, some of this, uh, he used to live in Nicaragua and he saw this being put into the, you know, the laws or constitution that really clamped down on some of these. So do you see, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question because um, on, on one hand, I, I must, I don't know if I must be happy for them, but it's like, they don't owe us that, but it's like, the, the, the thing is like, so I think in 2014, when the whole thing of job came out, um, they, they wanted to pass a law that gives um, them control of uh, content uh, of what the, the young people are posting on internet, not just young people, obviously they won't say young people, but just what people are posting online. But um, again, that was one of the demonstration that young people organized by job did to say this law and explain it to, to us. I mean, like 2014, I, that I, I was in the US and I was studying for my master's, but I didn't even understand how laws like that could affect me. And so he mobilized people and like um, they demonstrated against that. But so right now it is unlikely but you never know with, uh, you, you just never know until they feel really threatened, then maybe they will go back to that. But right now it is, it is pretty great. Maybe the only thing that um, they use is, I mean, the whole respect for parents. So where they would attack, when someone is questioning someone in leadership, then they would attack uh, that person and say you don't respect elders because respecting elders in my community I mean in my country is a it's a big thing so they'll be like you are you, you are a disrespectful child that's why you question you, you know the parents and stuff so character assassination that is there but I I, I hope and I don't think they would get that far I, I really hope they they don't get to the part where they will take away our Facebook and stuff. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. And um, you know, uh, I know there are more questions that may be coming towards the end. But again, thank you so much for taking us through. Um, you know, all of this. It's definitely. It seems like the same story. So we'll hear from uh, uh, Dr. Shingi Mavima uh, on the situation in uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mavima. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Awedu. Um, first off, let me start by saying that I'm not a man who gets nervous very much. I don't know why I'm nervous for this, though. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know, I'm glad to be here. Every time I'm, I link up with the with the African Studies Center um, at this point, it's a uh, it's a family reunion. It's not just uh, you know, and maybe that's the that's the spirit of tea time and other things, but so I'm glad to be here. Always glad to be uh, to be here. And also, uh, thank you so much to Tio Paulina for a fantastic presentation. Thank you, Doc. Uh, really uh, set the pace for what I'm going to talk about as well. Um, one thing that she did that I really enjoyed, but I did not. Uh, you know, I didn't do that myself. Well, let me let me share my screen first before, so you kind of know what I'm talking about here. Okay, perfect. So one of the things that she did a great job of that I didn't necessarily do was providing the background of how Namibia got to be Namibia as we know it today. Um, 
you know, but that's a conversation that, that we've had before. But in a nutshell, let me give a, a brief rundown of some of the ideas in the spirit of what she did, just so you know how we got to, to where Zimbabwe is. So again, another Southern African country, uh, which uh, borders South Africa, Zambia, Mozambique, Botswana, and is in the region as well, as you mentioned, uh, with, with, with Namibia and, and such. So um, in the 1880s, 1890s, uh, the scramble for Africa is happening. The British, you know, it's initially the British South African company lands in what is now Zimbabwe, right? And after some gamesmanship and, 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 and struggle, um, end up uh, colonizing the territory, uh, which is largely populated by a group of nearby a group of folks collectively known today as the Shona, right? Uh, as well as the Ndebele people who make up about 15% of the population and other smaller communities as well, including the, the, the uh, Kalanga, uh, Tonga and the likes. Mm -hmm. So that's the, that's, that's the collective. And uh, once it's colonized, it becomes Rhodesia. So one of the things that um, then the colonial period would last from the, from the late 19th century all the way until 1980 with a fundamental shift in 1965 when uh, the British, uh, you know, the, 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 the colonial era or the colonial project or the British empire as we know it was coming to an end. They decide to pull out of, uh, out of what was then Southern Rhodesia. And as a settler colony, uh, the, the, you know, so they pulled out of several territories, they pulled out of Nigeria and so forth. But as a settler colony, uh, Southern Rhodesia, the Southern Rhodesians who were settled there, by now, uh, we're talking about the British descendants who now numbered 300,000 or so, decided, no, we're not, we're not going to leave because the British said that. So they secede from the empire in what is known as the Unilateral Declaration of Independence. So from 1965 to 1979, 1980, essentially, uh, Zimbabwe as Rhodesia is a is a settler colony, yes, but it is a it is an it is independent of the of the empire, so to speak, much in the same vein as apartheid South Africa. Um, so there's that, and I will talk about some of the other things, uh, some of the reactions to that from the African community, from the Black community, shortly. But I wanted to highlight a few. As, as I was listening to Tio Paulina, listen, I, I wrote down things that I thought were similarities of the jump, right? Like right now, then evolving similarities, right? As well as what I consider to be, to be some stark differences uh, between um, Namibia and, 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 and Zimbabwe right now. So the similarities are that, 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 that jump out, the most obvious one is the length of the time it was colonized, right? From the late uh, uh, 19th century, Namibia gets its independence in 1988, I believe, um, one of the last ones. And I think before that, the last one to be independent was Zimbabwe in 1980. So a similar span of, of, colon of the colonial period. Much of, the, the, much of Africa got its independence in the 1960s. Uh, so to have the Southern African countries that were also settler colonies, which is the other similarity, right? That these were settler colonies. Very few of the colonized countries were, were settler colonies. By that, I mean, where there was a significant white population that stayed there. Uh, and those include uh, Zimbabwe, South Africa, of course, Namibia, uh, I believe Kenya, Algeria. So it's also another settler colony. And what that means is you're dealing with the same sort of land issues at a level that, uh, that other countries may not be dealing with. Then finally, a similarity that is, again, which she mentioned is the idea of the ruling party being dominant uh, and with unwavering support, particularly in the rural areas, but also just being there for a while, the idea of them not being in power was, uh, was unfathomable. So those are the similarities of the bad. One of the similarities where I feel that Zimbabwe is ahead in that trajectory, and this is not a positive or negative thing, it's, it's, it's what it is, is ahead is how much the, how much the uh, urban areas have tipped to the opposition, 
uh, to such a point that they are strongholds of the opposition now, right? Uh, you talk about Harare, you talk about Mutare, you talk about Machabeleland, uh, you know, these this bigger cities. Uh, yeah, the, you know, it's not even close anymore for the opposition, right? And I'll talk a little more about that. So that's an evolving thing that seems like Namibia is getting to that and maybe in, in 10, 15 years, um, it would have swung completely the other way. There are some key differences though, that I think are very uh, important. One is the extent of political violence, right? There's, uh, you know, you, you did mention, which is something that was very heartwarming, uh, especially from, from the space that I'm, I'm at, is the idea that uh, there isn't much in the form of uh, uh, election irregularities, whereas that is, a, a, you know, bread and butter in, in, in Zimbabwe for the most part which is also accompanied by, by severe political violence, which I will talk about when I get on. Then the second main difference is also the, the extent of the economic meltdown, right? Where Zimbabwe has, you know, has, a, has, a, has had a pretty ca catastrophic, uh, to, say, to put it lightly, uh, economic plight in the past uh, 20 years or so. Uh, with every now and then there's a, there's a moment where it looks like things might take a turn for the better but then we find ourselves back in the doldrums. So these are, I thought I would build on your presentation in that way and draw onto these factors. And uh, as I start to talk about my presentation here, you also see what I, uh, you also see what I'm getting at. So I'll get right into it. So these are my key ideas for today. First of all, I'm gonna talk about the historical tradition of youth activism in Zimbabwe, um, beginning with, uh, uh, during the colonial era, then as well as talking, uh, uh, doing a little bit of a, an overarching um, description of, of some of the post-colonial activities. Um, then talk about a fundamental shift that happens both locally and internationally at the two, in the 2010s. Uh, then point to what we call false dawns as in moments when we look like there may be change coming. Um, then we'll talk about 2020 you know, and 2021, there isn't much of 2021 to talk about yet, but that's a period I'll talk about at the end, uh, pretty much the current moment. Then discuss some controversies and limitations uh, that have uh, arisen vis-a-vis -vis, um, um, you know, youth activism and the internet as a space for it. Then we'll, we'll, we'll conclude. Um, so let's get going. So the idea of the youth being politically active is uh, is not is not new, you know, is not new to the story of Zimbabwe. Um, so when you look at so after you know as as the as the colonial project escalated, uh, beginning in the nineteen fifties. Different groups of young people got together and started organizing uh, politically. You know, uh, different African uh, young African people, uh, you know, got together and started organizing through political part through these political parties that were founded at the time. Some of the earlier ones, of course, eventually were were Zanu and Zapu founded in the early 1960s. So they organized politically. Then they also took to the front lines, right? So, you know, and fought in one of the more brutal, if you will, uh, liberation struggles in which tens of thousands of people died uh, in the, what some people call the, the Rhodesian Bush War. We call it the second Timurenga, um, right? And the people who fought in it. So for example, if you look at, the, at some of the people who are in it, the Zimbabwean president right now is what? 70, you know, mid to late seventies, I believe. Emerson Munangago, he was in the, he was in the Bush Force in the 1950s. So, uh, I mean, sorry, not 1950s, 1960s. So, you know, put him in his early teens. Look at the likes of uh, the vice. To 64 right now, who joined the School of Defense. She's another person who's, I think, is 62 right now. So, if we got independence in 1980, that's uh, 40 years ago, should have been 22 when we got independent and then she got in, uh, say with five years to go, that puts her again in her teen years. Such is the story, right? And even if you look at the other at the folks who were on the older end of the spectrum, 
if they got involved in the 1950s, uh, they would have been. So I say all this to say a lot of young people really took arms, right? As represented by this, uh, by, by this young fella here uh, and, and his peers who, you know, the older you get, the more you realize just how young these folks are. So independence comes uh, 1980, right? Uh, the, the Rhodesian experiment essentially because of the Bush war, because of sanctions, uh, because of these other things ends up uh, coming to an end. Um, and the 1980s are a period of socioeconomic honeymoon, you know? I say that, and I wanna say that with full recognition of, the, of, the, of, the, of some of the problems that happened, right? Particularly the massacres of the of the main Indabela people in the southwestern part of the country, uh, you know, during the the Gukura Hundi massacres of between 1982 and 1987, um, you know. So when you talk about the honeymoon period, it's tough, right, to talk about because there's there, there was that very prominent group in the country that suffered uh, near genocidal massacres, and which tens of thousands of people died. At the hands of uh, of the Fifth Brigade, which was a government, uh, at least a Mugabe-sanctioned uh, militant group. However, there's also a a that wasn't at the time that wasn't necessarily highlighted. It was again before social media in the rural areas and so forth, away from the from the from the from the big cities, if you will. And also, people are still clouded by this idea of the miracle of Zimbabwe that has come out of this colonial project and the president and other people have gotten on stage and spoken about reconciliation and the economy is booming, right, in that first decade. So the miracle of Zimbabwe coexists alongside, alongside that, 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 alongside this thing that's happening in the background, right, the, the Gukura Hunde massacres. Um, some of the early protests um, by, by the youth in, 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 in an independent Zimbabwe were actually around, um, were led by, by student activists at the, at the, at the University of Zimbabwe. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, my mom who is of that generation is uh, of, of students at the University of Zimbabwe at the time uh, is, also, is also here with us today. So that's nice. Uh, I don't know, she's never told me if she was on the front lines or anything like that, uh, but uh, but but uh, these were some of the people who were. But the but their activism was not so much um, in the vein of 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 the populist movements we are talking about here. They were very academic, sort of political leaning sort of arguments, right? Um, and also at the time, for my understanding, our university students would, would receive uh, very sizable grants. Uh, to attend college and and to as stipends, right? These uh, these grants they would receive. A lot of the protests were around the grants being late uh, and this sort of things, right? So very things that concerned them, but did not necessarily translate to the masses. Mm -hmm. However, by the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, corruption scandals are starting to rock. The, 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 the ZANU-PF uh, government, right? The ZANU-PF government, sorry, I didn't mention this. This is the party that comes into power very much in the mode of SWAPO, in the mode of the ANC, in the mode of these uh, revolutionary parties. And they come in and they, they sweep the election. There's really no competition. Again, very similar to, to SWAPO in those early years. Then as the 90s went on, I think 1995, is the first time, and this is after there's been uh, economic structural adjustments that are starting to make things a little bit tighter. Across the country for everybody. So now the, of the masses as well. Now we start to see them marching together. And in the midst of all that, the Zimbabwean uh, ZCTU, uh, the Zimbabwean Council of Trade Unions, also rises again, very much populated by young people. And these are the movements, uh, the youth-based movements that really start to, to protest. And, and again, the, the protest in 1995 was very, very prominent. Uh, so again, these are a lot of young people 
then in 1999, um, the movement for democratic change, which today is continues to be the biggest political opposition party, even though it's going through its own things, right, with splits and other internal conflicts, but it's founded in 1999, right? And it comes out of the student-based movement in the Zimbabwean uh, uh, Council of Trade Unions. In fact, the leader of the ZCTU, Morgan Changirai, goes on to be the founding president and would go on to lead the party until his death, I believe, in 2018, right? Yeah, 2018. Um, but again, it's a very youth-based movement. If you know the likes of, uh, for those who may know some of these people, the likes of Lerdmo Jongwe, who are very influential, even the current president of the, of the, of the MDC, Nelson Chamisa, is only in his early 40s, I believe, early 40s, late 30s, early 40s. Um, but, uh, you know, he's also, you know, he's also, he's also been there for a while. So that just goes to show at what stage a lot of the people joined. And um, that's in 1999. The party comes out, for lack of a better term, uh, guns blazing, right? They, they, they catch on very, very quickly, very, very quickly, such that in the year 2000, there was a referendum, a government-sponsored referendum that was meant to make some changes to the constitution. And up until now, ZANU PF has not lost anything. It hasn't even come close, right? So the idea was if you went along with the government, which, which would give the, the, the executive more power and other things, um, and other such things that would allow them to tighten a little bit better, um, you know, you would vote yes. The referendum led to people voting overwhelmingly no, right? And a large part of that is due to the activism of the MDC, which had been founded the year before. Uh, as well as other groups. And that really shook the Zimbabwean government, really shook the Zimbabwean government so that uh, in the next election, the following, uh, the next couple of years, uh, MDC walked away with a lot, lot of gains. They didn't win a, I can't remember what the thing was, but I mean, the, the, the ZANU PF still won pretty, but, but they had wrestled away some of the prominent territories within that first election. Uh, in the future ones, Actually, in 2008, uh, the, the main election in 2008, also, um, oh, so when I talk about the MDC, these are these guys here. Um, and when you see um, Arsenal and Manchester United supporters, uh, that's just because their colors are red. It's not because uh, there's any infinity uh, between those, uh, <laughs> those groups. But all right, so, so, going forward in 2008. So a few things happened in 2008. I think in, in Zimbabwean law, in Zimbabwean contemporary Zimbabwean history, the year 2008 is particularly pivotal for a number of reasons. One of them is there's an election, right? Uh, harmonized uh, presidential elections. And, and ZANU-PF, well, let me just say this, Mugabe loses that election, right? Now, Already, you know, they had gone okay. The lead up to it had gone okay, but he loses that election to 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 Morgan Changirai in terms of pure numbers, right? Now, official numbers have him still have him like losing, but uh, Changirai did not get a majority, so they had to go to a runoff. And when they go to the runoff, in, within that period, there's a lot, lot, lot of that's when the violence is escalated, right? And to such a point that, again, the year 2008, uh, you know, incites a lot of terror for many Zimbabweans uh, to this day, uh, just the mention of it. Uh, a lot of it is because of that violence that emanates and, and uh, you know, and, and the, the same thing would repeat again in 2013 uh, with the elections, uh, with, with electoral violence. Then the other thing too is that precipitates, it, it doesn't precipitate it, but it coincides with possibly the, the height of the economic meltdown in Zimbabwe where, you know, it had been going on for a while, but you know, the trillion dollar notes are being printed. Uh, you would be in the store, uh, which are very scarcely stocked. And between the time that you walk into the store and the time you get back to the counter, the price has changed. Uh, and, and so forth, these sort of things, right? I remember 
uh, uh, my uncle talking about how at the time they'd stop, you know, he was a, he was a, he was a top brass at one of the bigger uh, transportation companies in Zimbabwe. And he was telling me, and you know, this just blew my mind that they had stopped paying uh, their employees. And I'm not talking about, and I mean this, uh, you know, not as a value judgment or anything. I'm not talking about uh, what you call them, uh, sort of this uh, low level workers. I'm not talking about the custodial stuff and, and the likes. I'm talking about other people in the offices were starting to get paid by, by, uh, by way of groceries because cash was hard, tough to find by. And also because groceries were such a, a commodity at the time. So these trucks would be coming back from South Africa and people would be paid by way of, of groceries, which is just crazy to imagine at that level of the game because this wasn't just some, uh, some Mickey Mouse company, if you will, it was a pretty prominent company. Um, and, and, and again, that's probably some of the, the those some of the uh, milder stories to hear from that, from that era, everything goes crazy. Um, then in, in the aftermath of that, a lot of it is mitigated because the government of national unity is formed uh, between the opposition party, MDC, in which the Morgan Changirai is the, is the prime minister and Robert Mugabe of Zanupia remains the president and so forth. And that does bring some semblance of stability. It leads to the introduction of the US dollar as, as uh, I mean, multi-currency sort of economy where, you know, you would, you know, you could go into a store and see that this thing costs this much in US dollars, this much in pounds, this much in, in runs, uh, which are, uh, which were more stable currencies. Now I'm not an economist, so, you know, I, you know, I can't speak to the durability or sustainability of that, but I know that it really uh, shored things up a little bit better. Uh, there was a little bit more stability uh, and things just got a little better during that period which would last until the 2013, um, the 2013 uh, election, um, which again, uh, which ZANU, uh, ZANU PF would convincingly win given all those things convincingly, right? In, and I put that in quotations, uh, given all those factors that I've told you about with the political irregularities and the electoral irregularities and the, and the political violence. Uh, but what else has changed in, in going into that decade? Well, at the beginning of it, you see the Arab Spring, right? The, so the internet and social media in particular has become status quo. And you see the, the, the Arab Spring in, in you know, 20, 2010 to 2011, I believe, well, 2012 even, 2012. Um, and what that leads is, and I don't want to overstate the role of social media because it might take away from the real, very real groundwork that people did. But you know, the Arab Spring starts to move as a hashtag and soon the whole world is on it and it spreads across borders and, and dictators fall by way of it, right? Um, and you talk about that, you also talk about the, the birth of, of, of Black Lives Matter in the US after the, the Trayvon Martin uh, murder um, and other movements like that that are starting to happen. So the idea of using the hashtag to organize, you know, is, is starting to take shape. And again, that is the domain of youth in a, in a major way, right? It's, it's the young people who are starting to do that. And Zimbabwe is not too far behind. You see movements such as the Tajamuka, hashtag Tajamuka, uh, as pictured uh, here, uh, which I think comes about in 2014. Tajamuka is sort of, uh, and, and, and it translated into Sese Jikisile. Uh, Tajamuka is just a sort of a new age way of saying uh, we refuse, right? Or, or, and we refuse, but you know, that sort of refusing that is, uh, you know, don't touch me type, uh, you know, really just sort of uh, really pushing back. We resist. Yeah, I, yeah, we resist is, is, a, is, a, is a better way of saying it. Then a little bit later in 2015, 2016, uh, that this flag movement, uh, hashtag this flag becomes prominent as led by, uh, by Pastor uh, Evan Mawarire who recorded a poem or, you know, poem slash lament uh, in which he lamented uh, the different colors of the Zimbabwean flag and the things that they meant uh, and how that, that had been betrayed 
and people started to rally around him and he would put up this uh, uh, these uh, occasional speeches that really got the people going as, as, as a populist movement and he would end up getting arrested a few times throughout the course of that year and every time he would be arrested uh, the people would come out strong and, and, and go to, to the courts for it. Uh, in fact, I was, uh, as I was Googling this, I came across a, a few interesting pictures of people that I've since become acquainted with who were among the marchers for, for Pastor Ivan's, uh, uh, you know, freedom, if you will. So, so there's that shift that, that happens going into the, 23rd, into the 20, 2010s, and that energy has sort of uh, continued uh, to this day with the youth uh, being on the, on, the, on the front lines of this. And again, as I said earlier, from the time that MDC comes in, and increasingly so, uh, the urban areas overwhelmingly vote in their favor, right? So, and also, of course, the urban areas uh, where the youth are and where social media usage is. So, a lot of those things coincide. Okay. So, when I talk about false dawns, you see this, this, these activities, right? You see these, you know, what do the gains? of the social media sort of space look like. Of course, we see the, them as tools in which uh, uh, folks continue to organize as youth activists and political power has shifted. If not on the highest level, it's changing, it's changing in, 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 in within smaller constituencies, right? But when I talk about false dawns, um, the most important false dawn was, uh, and I mean, more insightful minds would have seen right through it from the beginning, but it was in 2017 uh, when, uh, when, when Robert Mugabe was removed from power after 37 years of rule, November 2017. And a lot of that was caused in this language of, of reform, right? That this is a, you know, we're ushering in a new dispensation as the new government uh, or had said. Now he was removed in an in essentially a military coup, right? What we call a coup, not a coup, but he was removed in that in that way. So that should have been our first sign there that you know, for all the work that the youth had been doing, the youth had not themselves made this happen, right? The agency of the youth as organizers and the you know. This wasn't that. I mean, in that moment, you want to believe that that's what it is. I mean, of course, there was a lot of pressure that was, uh, you know, with Mugabe being sort of the symbol and Mugabeism being uh, encapsulated by this sort of violence that I've been explaining and then the economic meltdown. But, but, but the military made this happen. So essentially, they are the power, you know? And now instead of, 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 of Mugabe, for example, it's the military that you're up against and you're really at their beck and call as far as how they decide to approach this. Now, you can hope that they, they, uh, they, they, they shift to, to, uh, to, democra to democracy and, and these other things, but that is not, you know, that is on them. Also, it wasn't a military that had been neutral in the past either. These are, these are the henchmen of the past administration, right? So that the president today, uh, Emerson Mnangagwa, is uh, was the was the vice president to to Robert Mugabe for a long time uh, before being fired a couple of months before all this happened, and he had been an ally even going back into the into the colonial era. I say all these things to say there was a hope, and so when so when Mugabe is removed from power in in, in November. Everybody comes out, right, as represented by this image here. Everybody comes out, the different the opposition parties come out, the different civ civic engagement groups come out. Uh, you know, they stand on cars, they give speeches, the opposition party, you know, the, the military organizes this whole thing and it's, it's pageantry at the utmost, right? Even Pastor Ivan Mawarira, who had been, um, you know, sort of a thorn in the, in, 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 the, in the administration side before, stands on a car, or stands on a platform and speaks to the people and gets a rousing response. And different groups talk about that as if the country has, has again ushered in a new dawn and we'll see more people being involved and we can move forward that way. Um, and uh, as fate would have it, in two weeks after all that happened, uh, as part of the charm offensive, really, uh, you know, he was acquitted. Uh, you know, Zimbabwe, that's the headline here. 
uh, from no 29 November uh, 2017. Um, you know, he's acquitted. And it's a moment of celebration and kind of plays into this whole narrative of like, maybe things have really turned, right? Maybe things have really turned. And of course, I talk about this when I say a false dawn is the, the first thing that people had thought would happen, that really people were pushing for, was in, to signify a good faith shift away from Mugabeism, uh, was, uh, was that there would be a government of, of, of national un unity or different stakeholders in the, in the, in the, in the social political realm would be included, right? And then you get a government that is very much ZANU-PF entirely, right? With a couple of technocrats here and there, but you know, essentially just ZANU-PF, some of the people were retained from the last administration. Some of the people are people who had uh, been kicked out or been on the, had been on, in a in a faction of Zanu PF that had been at loggerheads with with uh, with with with, uh, with the with the Mugabe side, which is known as the as the as the G uh, G forty. Um, but those people came back, so that's the first thing. And none of the people that folks had hoped to see incorporated into the project were brought in. Then the election, so that's not, you, you're not there officially, right? If you take over by coup, the election was put in, in uh, was scheduled for 2018. And for a long time in the run up to it, the run up to it was one of the most peaceful, uh, the run up to it, this is important, was for the most part, pretty peaceful that we had seen in, in a long time. It wasn't perfect, but I'm saying compared to what we had seen before in 2013 and 2008, for example, it was pretty peaceful with uh, different, even things that you'd never see before, like uh, on the national channels like ZBC and, um, and in public, sp you know, and in public spaces, being able to see the opposition posters everywhere on billboards. Things like that were not that common for them to be able to put their commercials on radio. Those things just weren't happening before. So this was part again of the charm offensive, and 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 um, and the administration had even been more open to having different observers come to you know external observers come to observe the elections. So on the surface, it looked like you know maybe there's been a turn here. However, at the back of our mind was always this idea that our folks who have removed the, long, the longest serving president in the country on the basis that he was about to betray the gains of the liberation, are they going to give up power to these young people when they, you know, should they lose the election? I personally just couldn't see that happening because if you thought Mugabe was betraying the gains of the liberation, what more of these people who were not even there during the armed struggle, right? So I just didn't think that was likely to happen. And true to my suspicions, uh, you know, that didn't happen. So when I talk about a false dawn, um, you know, in the immediate aftermath of the election, um, right? And it, the election is closed. Uh, you know, at least the official numbers being reported are closed. Zanu PF is in the lead, but not by much, you know, 53, 54%. Uh, type things as opposed to like, uh, you know, 50, 51, something like that. Um, you know, so, sorry, I mean, like, maybe like 51 to 48, these sort of the differences, nothing too major, right? But people are starting to point out irregularities in some of the way some of the elections are being delivered. And the opposition leader, uh, you know, uh, leadership uh, decides to, to get the people, and the elections, are, the results are also taking some time to come out which uh, after this year, I found out that that is not something that is uniquely African. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> um, then the leader of the opposition decides to put out a call for, the, for, for, for his supporters who again constitute mainly young people in the urban areas to the term that they used was Kudira uh, Jecha. Right, and and the, I, what Kudira Jecha translates to is uh, is pouring sand, and what they mean is you know when you cook sadza, right, which uh, is pop in South Africa on Sima in other parts of the country you know, or the continent, that dish, uh, which is the cornmeal dish, and if you don't know it, imagine cooking uh, fufu, for example, in other, you know very similar concept. So when it says pouring Jecha, it means to pour sand into the 
into the pot where that's being cooked. And the idea of that is to be disruptive, right? Like, so as they try to, that's what he was saying, as they try to, to rig the elections, let's go out into the street and demand that the, 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 the results be put out now and so forth, right? And as they, as they are doing that, the government in one of the most, and this is not a government that's been entirely innocent over the years, right? But in one of the most jarring acts, puts the military onto the streets, and this is part of this image here, captured here, um, puts the military onto the streets. And as a result of that, in August of 2018, six, that's what the six or seven people, if I remember correctly, were shot uh, and, and killed in sort of these, uh, you know, pushbacks. And a lot of them were not even the protesters. You know, the protesters didn't end up going because a lot of them got the, got the message ahead of time. But, you know, they, they hadn't been violent, you know, and, and, and some of the people who got killed were just people in the street. And it was such an ugly moment that really, if, if the public opinion, if the, the, the goodwill that had been extended uh, to the new administration in the first few months, pretty much evaporated after that. Then going forward, it seemed to be business as usual from, from some of the tyrannical practices we'd seen in the past. Uh, for example, in, 20, in the beginning of 2019, and this is where uh, my prayers are for, for Namibia that this never happens. I think there was something else that was being organized. Oh, the fuel had gone up like crazy and people were planning to, uh, organizing to protest. And there was a uh, uh, internet shutdown um, you know, in January of 2019, uh, you know, WhatsApp, which is a large place where people organize, uh, Facebook, Twitter, these sort of sites, you know, were just, uh, you know, again, I'm not in that world of, of technology, but they just weren't working. We couldn't get in touch with people. Uh, so a lot of people were migrating to, to Telegram in that moment in the hope that it's one place. But again, you can imagine the, the effort it would take for a whole community, large communities to transfer to a new space and still try to organize. And I remember thinking at the height of this, this is when, um, when Oliver Mtukudzi, Zimbabwe's most celebrated musician passed away. Um, and I remember just thinking that, wow, man, because that really took attention from everything that was going on as, as the country came together to mourn. To, I was thinking, you know, in a way, you know, and I hate to be, I'm a poet, so sometimes I stray into this, into this, into this realm, but in a way, Tukume have really stopped this, this, this country from, from, from imploding, you know, again, he's unified us one last time as he leaves, but that happened in, in January of 2019. Other things that happened as well is, uh, you know, that's continue to point to this tyranny, uh, is there's this group of, again, mostly young people, one of the guys I'm very familiar with, I didn't know you as one of the guys, but I ran into him, uh, you know, one crazy night and we've actually done a couple of, uh, of, of, of nonprofit things together. But they had traveled to Maldives uh, for a conference that was being held on, you know, something basic like, uh, like mobilization or something uh, because a lot of them are involved in like civil organizations. And they came back and, uh, and as they touched down, they were arrested uh, on on traveling to 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 Eastern Europe or, or you know uh, my geography fails me wherever Maldives is uh, to to organize around toppling the toppling the government uh, and they've they just recently got acquitted in in August of 2020. But but such is the is the paranoia that I feel like is is that a fever ever is that a fever pitch in recent times. Same thing with this, uh, with this uh, young ladies yeah, who are prominent politicians in, 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 in the opposition party as well, uh, who were really abducted, right? For lack of a better term, abducted, then really just brutally abused and, 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 and uh, you know, thrown in ditches. I remember if the story goes, then after that, they've been repeatedly arrested again for, you know, and I always think that, you know, I think it's, it's really sort of the lowest of the low, I think, uh, as far as these things go, the, the way they've been treated. And this, all this helped spark uh, the next phase here, which was the, the Zimbabwean Lives Matter movement, 
Um, there were protests organized in, in July uh, that were supposed to push back against some of the, 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 the crackdowns on, 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 on the likes of, of Joanna Mamombe and the likes. And as the government was pushing back on that, uh, there was uh, some other high profile arrests, which include the likes of Tsitsi Dangarembuga, who is, uh, uh, you know, who is, uh, who is uh, the writer of the book Nervous Conditions, one of Zimbabwe's most celebrated writers, as well as other prominent people. And that's, that's the time when the Zimbabwean Lives Matter movement started. And I think I have something about it in the next slide here. Um, then I will, I will make sure to conclude with a little bit of time. So, okay. So Zimbabwean Lives Matter, these, women, these young women have been, uh, have been, have been persecuted. Um, you know, things are just not looking up. Add to that the fact that there's the, there's the global Black Lives Matter movement that's been going on, right, uh, over the summer here, the summer of 2020. And you see that movement spreading everywhere. There's similar calls in different communities. And, and Zimbabwe, it wasn't too far behind with that. So the Zimbabwean Lives Matter uh, movement chimed in. And for all the fear that is put in people, the Zimbabwean people really came out swinging. And, um, and, and but also they received a lot of Pan-African support. So this is a, a flyer by the EFF, which is a prominent uh, political party in South Africa, right? Uh, you know, pro, uh, very Africanist in slant. So this is the flyer they had made. Burner Boy, who is quite possibly the most, the biggest African musician, at least in our generation, uh, at the, at this moment, uh, put this tweet out, and uh, and and uh, and it really caught on. A lot of other people too, all the way to Ice Cube, the rapper Ice Cube, out of out of uh, straight out of Compton, uh, also tweeted something. So it really caught it really uh, proliferated and a lot of Zimbabweans were saying things as well. Uh, so it was for a while throughout August, really, it was, uh, you know, it was prominent. I don't think it had the endurance that I, that I, that uh, many people would have hoped it does. Um, but it really did put Zim the plight of Zimbabweans on the, on the map in a way that it, at least, in the post uh, Mugabe era, in a way that that hadn't happened before. Um, so, what are some of the controversies and limitations of this activism? If people are, you know, uh, 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 if the youth are uh, being active, if the youth are uh, are speaking up, what are some of the limits? What are some of the limits? Well, first of all, the internet continues to be a a, a privileged space, right? How much can you engage with the internet, especially in you know, over here from the US, it might seem like people have the internet all the time. But who has access to that? Of course, you can be on WhatsApp and, and Facebook, even then that, that costs a little bit. But 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 it's 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 a privileged space. Um and and part of that is is this idea that I don't think everybody can has at least not yet has the access or unlimited access to it that would really facilitate, um, you know, the revolution at the highest level, you know, and I could be wrong about that, but that's my suspicion. Closely tied to it being a privileged space is this idea of the, of the rural urban divide. In fact, tied to these two points, there was a prominent radio personality who was on just being interviewed on a, in a, in, on a West African radio channel, and she's from Zimbabwe. And she had made a comment that earned her a lot of backlash regarding how there was a huge disconnect between the people who are doing the, the Zimbabwean Lives Matter movement and the rest of the community. And, and I think the backlash was, was justified in part. And I think, you know, her point, I don't know if this is what she meant to say, but I think it could have been articulated a little better. Uh, a lot of it stems from this idea of the internet being a privileged space. Now, this is not to say people who are not on the internet are not suffering as well, or are not communicating in other ways, but I think um, organizing is organizing and you can only organize with the people who are within the space you're organizing for. So when you look at say the rural urban divide, uh, I was looking this up yesterday and I was pr pretty surprised to find out that the Zimbabwean rural population is still 68%, that's almost 10, billion, 10 million people, the 15 million people who live there. 68% um, 
Um, right. So that means at most, assuming that people in the rural areas aren't really on the internet like that, um, there's this 30% that is very active. And that's only if all of them are active in these spaces, right? The urban areas. And um, so already there's that huge divide of the movement. Movements would benefit a lot more by bridging that rural urban divide because while the opposition is, is dominance in the urban areas now, that is still 30% of the country. And the ZANU PF continues to have dominance in the, in the rural areas. Uh, even though, as you can tell, when I say the elections are 50, 50 uh, low 50s to high 48, it means like even the supporting the rural areas is eroding a little bit, but a lot of those places are still dominant uh, strongholds of, of, of the, so that's a place that has to be reached to as well. Another accusation that has happened is this idea of apathy among the youth. And I put a question mark on that because I don't necessarily believe it myself. Uh, this uh, gentleman, Hopewell Chingono is a prominent journalist who has been repeatedly arrested uh, for, you know, he's always, he's a thorn in the government side, you know, it's very vocal, but he's been repeatedly arrested. But recently he came out swinging against the youth, uh, pointing to the fact that, uh, you know, some of the young activists were not followed on social media, but some comedians or other people like that who had hundreds and thousands of followers. You know, to which, you know, I can understand his frustrations given his positionality, but it's also the youth who are making things like Zimbabwean Lives Matter or the hashtag Free Hope Wall, which was a prominent uh, hashtag throughout the year. Uh, so I don't think they're as apathetic as that, you know, but they're also still, for all these other reasons that I've stated, right, their, their, their impact is, is, continues to be limited, right? Then another thing is this new wine, old skins, uh, the politicians, uh, you know, there wasn't the shift of the guard that we'd expected. And finally, now what? You know, what is the what what does a successful Zimbabwean Lives Matter campaign look like? You know, and I think a lot of people are starting to ask that, like, okay, we do all this, right? These are some of the things that generates the sort of leth uh, lethargy and apathy. Like, what does success look? Where is this gonna go? The military, uh, the military supported government or the government itself. Are they gonna let go because of <laughs> because of the so so that's one of the things that people continue to think about, right? And it's really taking the air out of these movements. Like, all right, so now what? So now what? And I don't mean that to be to be a debit downer because you know I wanna see where this goes, but it's really like where 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 does this go? Where does what's what's the end game here? Uh, with some of those movements. So that really does discourage some folks. And it's something that we continue to think about uh, with these movements uh, uh, as we study them and as people partake in them. So in conclusion, uh, the, here's, a, here's a, the same quote by two different uh, folks, right? So you have uh, Oben Pov of the ZANU PF saying, hashtags come and go, but ZANU PF endures be be beyond the trending. Kind of speaks to my now what point. Then on the other hand, Tsidangarem, with the, the activist writer I was talking about earlier, says the same thing. Hashtags do come and go. The clampdown still exists, but now it's up to us to find ways forward to sustain this momentum. So this idea of sustaining the momentum, that's the big thing, right? That, that's, that's the missing piece. As one of the rappers who sang around this says, uh, as in, uh, yeah, somebody give us that answer. So I will stop here. I know I've, uh, I think we have 10 minutes or so left, but yeah, this was my, my, my little talk on this. And uh, uh, I hope I, I, I hope I was, uh, I was clear as I could. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mavima. And you know, there's a reason why you are, you are in history. And uh, you have done, um, you know, a lot of justice to, you know, Zimbabwe and by extension, uh, much of you know the south so I have um, I don't know today has been a lot of learning on my way as well like I keep saying some of these conversations really make you think about uh, you know things that you hadn't uh, you know before and uh, you know before the questions come in all both of you have actually you know talked about the fact that you know the social media is actually pushing uh, you know the agenda now of course there's a divide around okay who are the urban who are, you know, in the rural, the rural actually seems to be the biggest area. Again, Dr. Shingi, like you say, where the ruling government are actually, you know, capitalizing 
uh, you know, uh, to kind of win most of these elections. One thing that uh, you probably have also talked about is that um, these spaces, uh, the social media, uh, are big. And I am beginning to think uh, that um, they probably don't even understand what power they wield currently. Or if they do, I don't know how they are probably going to be, you know, handling that because they've become spaces where both falsehoods and, you know, truths and, you know, all of that are kind of, you know, uh, more moving along. So looking at uh, even the USC alone, when do you make a decision to say, let's take somebody, you know, out, let's flag this, let's flag this, and that you're supposed to be doing it globally is, uh, is, uh, is, is going to be quite a challenge and, you know, an area they have to engage. I don't know if you've um, had um, anything of, um, uh, you know, recently Facebook had to, uh, you know, flag and, you know, uh, close certain accounts, uh, you know, of uh, government bloggers, you know, in the Ugandan, you know, uh, you know, space. Uh, because of the falsehood, you know, things. Have you seen, uh, you know, uh, such things happen, you know, in South Africa? Because I know you see the internet is shut down, but the internet was shut down as, a, you know, an end kind of result because they try to add you saying our bloggers have to be on, on Facebook. They have to be passing on our information. Yes, they know they're passing on falsehoods. And actually, we had to block their accounts. And so they will not get them back. And so the government reacted by actually saying, okay, fine, we'll now have a total blackout you know, of the internet, especially around the social media space. So how do these, uh, there, there become spaces where we push a lot of information, but how do, how do you leverage, uh, you, uh, you, you know, the kind of um, uh, information, education that, you know, goes on, uh, on, on this social media for the benefit of both sides? Mm. So how do we, uh... But, you know, I think it goes back to that last thing I was saying that I think we are still trying to, it is, it is in, su it is in such uh, infancy, right? Yeah. As a way of doing, you know, it's, it's in its infancy globally, but especially in these spaces where access is still limited, that we are still trying to figure out the same question you are asking, what, how can we leverage this, you know? And I think that the false dawns that I spoke about earlier have been, have been deceptive because we've been able to organize to rally for, I mean, I'll say we, you know, I wasn't there, but uh, we've been able to, to uh, you know, folks have been able to organize to rally for the release of, of some of these people, right? Um, and, you know, and you organize by way of social media and this sort of thing, and you go out there and you're in your numbers and somebody's released. And... After a while, I'm starting to think like, I wonder if that's even a ploy, right? To sort of make it seem as if the, as if the powers that be are, are receptive to, to criticism and they, they can allow to let this one go so that it looks like, look, we'll let this guy go. If we were that bad, would we do this? That's something that I've been thinking about lately. So I'm not too sure. I mean, I'm still, I'm still studying this and trying to see what the best way uh, to, to, to leverage these things are, right? But I think probably just, you know, persistency, right? The, you know, I think we can, it can be a flash in the pan sort of movement where, you know, three months later, we've forgotten that we were, we were pushing for this thing, right? It has to be consistent and also very outlined goals. What is the goal of a movement? What is the, what, what, if this goes well, what happens at the end of it and when? So I think that those are some of the things that are very important to, to outline indeed. Yeah. That, that fascinated me a lot, especially because the go-to of most governments is, you know, to actually get you out of business, shut you down. But now a business such as Facebook or, you know, any such is difficult to kind of, you know, approach and do that too. Mm -hmm. So they kind of are having their, you know, their hands tied behind and, you know, they can't do much. And this is a space where people are actually de delivering from all over the world. It's mm -hmm. a space where, uh, you know, lots of people in the diaspora are actually engaging and, you know, participating actively, you know, driving the politics and the agenda, uh, mm -hmm. you know, at home. So it's an area that I think, uh, you know, leaves a lot to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, studied down the road, but uh, I see it changing, uh, mm -hmm. especially because of the fact that uh, uh, the phones are becoming cheaper 
and mm. um, uh, you know people can access these uh, you know uh, you know kind of uh, platforms a little more, mm. and so it's 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 going to keep getting interesting. So some other questions, please. From uh, I saw did Nick oh, wait? I think that's my click. Uh, Alexis, did you have a question? Oh, I I can't see anyone raising their hand. So no question for me. Just listening. Okay, no. No, no, okay, no questions there. All right, let's see here. Ooh. Yes, I think I think uh, Dr. Shing, you can uh, can get this here. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm reading the. You know, I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on this. What do you think caused the changes in the focus of university student activism? The activism is largely focused on issues that are specific to students, but recently the activism's touched on. Um, I, you know, I think these movements in the region feed off of each other. Absolutely, I, I don't know to to the extent that I can say. I think, yeah. Let me let me start by saying this. Uh, my answer to the first one, then I'll talk about whether I feel there's a, there's a connection between these two. I think. Because the, the shift in Zimbabwe happens much sooner than, than the Rose Must Fall uh, advent, right? I think by the time we get to the foundation of the MDC and the 2000s, uh, the, the, the things have already coincided. I, what I think happens is the students continue to have their qualms as they did in the beginning, right? But as the masses start to protest as well, remember that the, again, unless you were in the, in the areas I described earlier, unless you were in those, once you come, you know, things look like they were okay, you know, in that first decade of Zimbabwe. But as people, as the as ASAP kicks in and as the corruption is be, uh, being brought more to light, the masses are also starting to protest, right? The promise of independence is disappointed. So I think there's that convergence of students who are already protesting about their own thing, right? But now the urban masses are starting to protest as well, and they come together in that way, right? They find uh, a lot of them have graduated and have landed up in, in the same um, popular space where people are protesting. So I think that's, that, that's what leads to that. Does it feed off of Rose Must Fall and the things like that? Absolutely, absolutely. I think later in more recent years, because Rose Must Fall is as recent as what, as 2013, 2014. Um, but you know, when you say, when the hashtag is ZANU-PF must go, you know, it's it's clear where that where that comes from, you know. So I think those movements are definitely feeding off of each other. A lot of them look alike. We should look at the, ter at the at the terminology of it, like so, Black Lives Matter, Zimbabwean Lives Matter. So they are feeding off of each other in that in in that way for sure. All right. Okay. And um, you know, thank you so much again. We have two minutes to the end of our uh, uh, slated time here. Uh, you know, which always seems, uh, you know, short. That's why we used to continue the talk when the <laughs> times were what mm. they were with the tea and biscuits, which uh, Dr. Monson, hopefully, in, I don't know, maybe 2022 will be back, uh, you know, but, that, but again, thank you so much for taking your time um, uh, to, to really prepare uh, the presentations for, you know, the people that did attend today. Very, very informative. And like Dr. Monson said here, I think it's interesting to see how everything that's happening in this country is, is kind of intersecting and the fact that the internet is kind of uh, connecting the entire continent. Mm -hmm. You know, this matters even, you know, to other continents. So, yep, I couldn't be any much proud of the two, you know, any proud of the two uh, presenters today. Again, thank you so much. And for those in Michigan, I think, you do know the weather advisor and everything. I see things are starting to shake up a bit. <laughs> uh, you guys that are home probably don't don't know this, but uh, yep, uh, I wish you all the best. And uh, you know, again, thank you for being part of the tea time today. And uh, yep, see you next time, two weeks. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all.